Now, I'll send that to them anonymously, so you don't need to worry about well, no, it. We won't <laughs> <know. laughs> uh, uh, finally, the last section is your email address. If you wish to put it in, uh, we are sponsored by JetBrains. Uh, there will be a raffle, and the, the lucky number picked will receive a license for one of their products, whether it's uh, a full IDE or it's a plug-in library sharper. Uh, usual housekeeping things, toilets are on the ground floor in that corner over there. There was some beer <laughs> over there, I don't know if there's any left, uh, help yourself. Um, but do remember that we get this place from my lab for free every month, so if you'd like to leave a donation that would be much appreciated and it goes to keeping this place upright. Um, first, tonight we have Andy Longshore, who will be saying, uh, talking about, we said it was Easy. We, we, didn't say, we didn't say it was easy, we said it was simple. Yes, that one, that's the one. Um, and without further ado, time. So, okay, off we go. So, we said it was simple, we said it was simple. Right. So, this, this came out of a, a tweet that Ron Jeffries fired out uh, about a year ago that caught my imagination. And I said, uh, oh, we planned it two years ago, bloody hell, it was half life. We didn't say it was easy. We said it was simple. So this got me thinking about it. So it's simple. The Agile Manifesto, simple. Individual and interactions over process and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation. It's a bit like one of those gigs where you expect people to join in part way through with the, you know, the, the popular songs. Customer collaboration, responding to change. Agile Manifesto, great stuff. Um, XP values, courage, simplicity, feedback, communication, respect. Read the t-shirt. <laughs> it's easy. Very good. Yeah? Well, it's reasonably simple. It's reasonably easy. Uh, so it's, sorry, so it's, it's, sorry, simple rather. So it's reasonably simple. Um, so these are the 12 um, agile um, principles. So I'm sure you can all, you know, again quote these off by heart. But, you know, we're getting into things like uh, getting simplicity. Um, Technical excellence, uh, delivering working software frequently, so you know, there's more stuff in here, but I'm sure it's still simple. So, how hard can it be? Simple. Right, so look at the different people involved. Um, this I've, 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 uh, I've made one of, the, uh, one of our team's guinea pigs on this, so they've got their pictures on this. So, the developers on the team, it's not easy for them. Yeah, It's simple, but it's not easy. Well, why is it not easy? Okay, they've got to take responsibility for the, for the stuff, you know. They've got to have discipline to follow the processes, even under pressure, you know, when, they, when people are screaming for a release. They've got to say no when things can't be done, rather than we'll try. They've got to ask for help when they need it, rather than trying to, trying to um, some, you know, do everything. They've got to follow through on their retrospective actions, because everybody does that, yeah? <laughs> They've got to seek feedback and they've got to keep improving. And they've got to keep refactoring until it's simple. So, that's for the developers. Now, testing specialists, it's not easy for them either. They've got to be more proactive than they would do in a waterfall environment. They've got to get really good at business analysis skills, taking part in the three amigos and things like that. They've got to learn some coding so they can pair with the developers and help them with their tests. They've got to get really good at exploratory testing. We've got to spend a lot of time teaching people about what makes a good test. So this is what, you know, suddenly the tester's plate is a lot more full of stuff they've got to do. Oh, and also they've got to do everything the developers do. DevOps specialists. It's not easy for them. They've got to automate all the things. <coughs> They've got to master the different tools for deployment, the build, the test, and all the different containers you're using. They've got to refactor the pipeline again for another technology you've got, in the new technology that's been brought into it. Oh, and also they've got to do all the things the developers have got to do. The product owner. So he's selling the product owner, it's not easy for her because she's got to spend a lot of time out building talking to customers, understanding the market. But she's also got to be available for the team to answer questions and take part in Three Amigos. We've been two places at one time. 
So you're also going to find enough time to do enough work on the backlog so the backlog's coherent and ready to go when you get to the, get to the next story. And she's also got to deal with various bits of the organisation on behalf of the team by communicating bad news, i.e. the truth about the delivery term schedule. Or, um, you know, the changes in, in features, the features that are not going to be in the next release. So, does not make her life easy? The organisation's technical leadership, ignore this guy, the organisation's technical leadership is not easy for them because they've got to recruit people who can do all this stuff. They've got to tr then trust them to make, to, to, to make good decisions and to prioritise that they're doing the right thing and to ask for help when they need it so that you can step back and get rid of that itch to try and interfere all the time. You've got to deal with the other bits of the organisation on behalf of the team that the product owner doesn't deal with. And they've got to let people get on with making the mistakes and learning as they do that. Um, they're doing stuff, they're making mistakes and stuff and learning on stuff that you can probably already do yourself and you could do it faster yourself, but you've got to let them do it because otherwise it will never work, you know, the team will never gel. So you need to just with all this management crap that you'd rather not do because you're rather coding. I know, we'll get a coaching that will help out, but it's not easy for them. They've got to try and influence the team in just a couple of days a week, probably. They've got to change the culture, change the working practices. Oops. We've got to set a good, consistent example of how to be an agile developer. And they've got to teach people the same stuff over and over again in different ways without going post op Now, who can we find who could do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's not easy because you need, to, you need the discipline, you need to avoid, you know, if anybody's looked at Kinefin framework, you know, the, you know that there's the, between simple here and chaotic there, there's like this little bit where you slide down from one to the other because you just become sloppy and stop being disciplined. So we've got to avoid that. Most of the challenges are around soft skills rather than around technology. This is not a techie strong point, so, you know, that makes it difficult. You have to change yourself. For all this sort of stuff, you know, the courage and this sort of thing, you have got to be part of that change, which is difficult. And you have to learn when to have iron discipline. We are going to do the tests, we are going to do this. And when you can improvise, it's like, no, we don't need to test that, it's too simple. You know? And, you're, and, you, and the problem is, another problem is your organisation is a square and you are a circle. You want to do all these great agile things in this circle. This is a Jürgen Apello thing. But the, 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 so he talks about with square within the, the circle within the square. You've got to want to do all these wonderful agile things in here. Your organisation has got a whole bunch of tax it takes on you. And you've got to basically you know, feed them that tax money while you can carry on doing the agile stuff. But mostly, it's not easy because nobody's told the wider business that work, the, 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 sorry, nobody's sold the wider business on working in an agile way. And agile software development doesn't deliver the benefits unless the whole business is working with the grain. That's why a lot of organisations end up in what I would refer to as Tommy mode. So this is for the older people in the audience. There's some there's a, there's a, there's a, the Tommy the Rock Opera they might remember by the new in the mid 70s. Because it's the, 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 the deaf and blind kid who played a mean pinball. Um, it's basically, he had this thing at the end of the film where he, he, he let people learn his way of doing things by putting in earplugs and a blindfold and a, a, a you know, mouth plug and so on, so that they were deaf and blind and they could then learn to work, learn to be great pinball players. And guess what? They rebelled. They said, we ain't going to do this. This is just too hard. We don't want to be like you. We just want to have the great pinball skills. So sure. Yes. This is, how, this is the, the way we learn to do this. So that's where you get to, you know, this, this way I'm going to take where you end up with flaccid scrum, cargo cut agile, cargo cut agile, and all this sort of stuff. But XP and, you know, the other agile approaches, they only work when you've got the dials turned up to 10. You know, you, it's no good doing a bit of agile. You know, we're a bit agile on Wednesdays. You know. So remember, we said it was simple. We never said it was easy. If you're finding agile software development easy, you're probably doing it. Thank you. Okay. Rant over. <laughs>
<laughs> Any questions for Andy before he sits down? Services. Uh, can you, um, Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the webcam will, will cut out. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, before I start, a little bit of background and why I want to talk about microservices. So, as we all probably heard, microservices is the big buzzword nowadays. So, everyone is talking about microservices. Everyone wants to do microservices. So, how many people here are doing microservices currently? Okay, quite a few. Yeah, good. Yeah. So, uh, in the last few years, um, I started development uh, in Peninsula Business Services here in Manchester, and then I moved to ThoughtWorks as a consultant and worked at many different projects. And for the last three years, I've been using microservices in different projects, different environments. And I saw a lot of projects fail, and I saw a lot of projects succeed. So tonight, I'm not going to convince you why you should use microservices. I'm going to talk about what are the problems that you will see if you are going to use microservices. So, uh, as I said, I was uh, working for Peninsula, Dental Works. A few months ago, uh, myself and my business partner, Kate, we had an idea to uh, change recruitment. So, as a developer and a business analyst, we said that we built Astrolab for uh, techie people, and we started it in Manchester. So, go and have a look and give us some feedback. And by the way, this is built by microservices. I'm gonna use some examples of what uh, we use microservices for and how we built Astrolab uh, during the talk. So, on paper, uh, building a microservice, building your application in microservices makes sense. And all of us work with monoliths, with big software that is hard to refactor, it's hard to release. And if you are making one part of, we are changing one part of the software, we have to release everything. If we want to scale only one part of the software, again, we have to scale everything. So we all are familiar with problems of monolith systems. And uh, on a slide, it makes perfect sense to break that big software into smaller pieces and make that complexity of domain go away. But uh, the question is, if the complexity goes away, where does it go? And I think this is, this is the first problem that I want to talk about. That this complexity that uh, uh, we had in domain in monoliths will go to interaction points between services and we'll go to our deployment and releasing strategy, so uh, releasing practices. So when we are working with microservices, uh, releasing deployment becomes very, very hard. So most of us are used to uh, working with monoliths. It means that we have one, two, three, maybe four applications that we are running in our CI pipeline. And uh, then we want to jump into microservices world when all of a sudden we want to have tens or even maybe sometimes I saw hundreds of microservices in pipelines and that is orders of magnitude more complex than running just uh, um, uh, one single, single application in, in your pipeline. So if you're doing microservices and you're not managing operational complexity uh, very well, you're going to see a lot of that. You're going to see a lot of manual testing after each release. You will usually see massive UI testing frameworks and in a lot of places, I saw dependency, uh, well, what people call deployment dependency trap as well. So one of the greatest benefits of microservices is that you can deploy them individually. That means that uh, each service can evolve and can uh, be released without touching other parts of the system. And in a lot of businesses, I saw that because they're not good at managing operational complexity, they have to release everything together. And straight away, you lose one of the biggest benefits of microservices. A recent example of this, uh, actually when we came up with Astrolab idea, we were commuting to Glasgow every month, every week, not every month. And we were working for a student loans company. And a student loans company, very complex domain, they had 36 microservices, and they had uh, deployment dependency. So it meant that 
any small change to any service, they had to deploy the whole system, run a lot of manual tests, and then do a lot of uh, testing after that. So uh, that wasn't really an ideal situation, and they didn't get any benefit from using microservices architecture. So one way to manage this is to do DevOps as a team, to embrace DevOps culture, and not have an operational team and a software development team. Not even a software development team and a DevOps person. My uh, advice is to have DevOps as part of your practices and all of your developers should do DevOps. Another thing uh, is to use cloud if you can. So I've seen many different projects and the ones that are using cloud are much more successful than the ones that are using on-premises infrastructure, simply because there are a lot of tooling around managing complexity for things like AWS or Azure. Uh, so, uh, but if you are moving to a microservices architecture, this is, I think, the biggest thing you need to think about. The second uh, issue that I want to talk about is uh, higher cost of refactoring. refactoring. So uh, the IDEs that we are using, if you're using uh, Visual Studio or Sublime or IntelliJ, all of these IDEs have really, really good cap uh, capabilities to do refactoring. So if you want to change a class, if you want to rename something, if you want to extract something out, it's really easy to do it when you are in one code base. As soon as you move into multiple code bases, it becomes a nightmare. And especially when you have a concept that spans across multiple services, it becomes really, really difficult to uh, refactor that, uh, that bit of the code. And I think Andy had it in his talk, refactor until it's simple. It's very hard when you have microservices to refactor it until it's simple. So here, uh, I would say, uh, build it as part of an existing service first, then refactor it until it's simple, then break it out as a, as a different service. This gets especially hard when you're changing uh, contracts. So if you're refactoring, changing the service contract, that makes thing very, things very, very difficult because then uh, you have to test it with everything else. And for that, I saw that a lot of people are using integration testing, which again makes things very slow and very hard. So just to help with that, make sure you're using con uh, consumer-driven contract testing. Uh, and tools like Pact are quite helpful. So this is this is a talk on its own how to do this. But have a look at Pact on GitHub. It's a very, very good tool and makes your whole integration test suite go away. And uh, you unit test all of the contracts uh, using, uh, using Pact instead of integration testing them. So, and then that makes refactoring a lot easier. Another thing that makes refactoring hard is getting the service boundaries wrong. And that sounds pretty simple on paper, but uh, in projects, I've seen it that it becomes a big nightmare. So uh, we all know developers uh, become very, very passionate about how to, where to put code, whether it's a different module, any microservices, whether it's a different service, is it part of an existing service? And again, at student loans, I've been to meetings where they debated this for hours, sometimes for days talking about where to put the new entity, is it a new service, is it part of an existing service. And this can create a lot of problems. Again, it makes you lose one of the biggest uh, benefits of microservices as well. So uh, this is another thing that you need to look for. And from my experience, try to add any new entity to an existing service, never create it as a, as a new service. And then build it as, a part, as part of a new uh, existing service, do your refactoring, make sure it's simple. On last responsible moment, once you're comfortable with the code, once you know enough about the code, then move it into a different service. So these were all the three points that I had. So I think I cut too much from this talk. So this talk was originally 45 minutes, when Mark told me it's only lightning talks, I cut a lot of slides. So, but, uh, the last one is general recommendations on how to do microservices. And this is again, learning from experience. Uh, so uh, the first one is start very, very small. So Martin Fowler recently had an article, start with a monolith. I don't agree with that. I say start with two different services, don't start with a monolith and then grow it from there. And that's how, that's how I did it on, on, on Astrolab. So we had only two services, we went live eight weeks ago, and now we have five services. So uh, once we were very, very comfortable with our releasing strategies, with our testing, and we were sure that we could deploy every, service, every single service independently, then we started to 
create more services. And now that we have many services, it means that different parts of the system can scale differently. So we don't need to scale everything or uh, release everything together. And the last point is really just to make sure that you're comfortable with all of those practices before moving to microservices. So deployment automation, very, very important. Again, if you're using cloud computing, there are some really, really good tools out there to do it. Monitoring and troubleshooting is another one. So again, if you're starting with two services, it's quite easy to debug and test and troubleshoot two services. If you have more, it's hard. Get good at it first and then move to uh, more services. And that's it. So, okay. You said that you started with two, yeah. but then you, now you have five. Yep. Um, did the extra three come by splitting stuff out of the existing two, or were they additional? Yes, no, uh, they came uh, out of like splitting the, one, the other ones into more services. And then uh, one thing that we did, we built like uh, a pipeline template that we could just drop some code in it and it would just create a service and then release it and deploy it. And because it's really uh, all of the process is automated, it's quite easy to say, okay, this whole entity, this bounded context makes sense to be its own service. So it's quite easy to just cut the code, put it in the service template, put it in the pipeline, and it's, it will be released. So, it's very, very little effort once you automate everything and you get that uh, those practices that I mentioned. Yeah? What microservices share a database? Uh, no, they don't. And uh, I think that's that's a big debate whether they should have uh, uh, shared storage or not. I personally think they shouldn't. Uh, one example project that I worked on was Tramchester, if you've heard of it. So Tramchester, we had this issue that we had the timetable data in uh, relational database formats and we had the whole uh, root finding bit that we thought it could be a graph database and we split it into two services so there was one that was dealing with timetables had a MySQL backend database and the other service which was in charge of root finding had a graph database and Kate is laughing at me because we've talked about changes so much so uh, and we had two separate services, two different types of a storage. So I think that's very helpful to use right tool for the job. So if you need to use a graph database, use graph database. If you need to use a document store, use a document store. Don't stick to like one big or SQL database. Yeah? What influences your decision of when you should bring something up into a separate service? So I think uh, for me is when I have enough information and uh, it's when you know that domain well. And uh, so uh, I think as Andy said, we write some code, we refactor it until it's simple. And uh, when I think about all the code that I wrote in, in, in the past, and it's always a point I said, oh, I could have broken, it down, broken this down to, to smaller pieces. So I think once I have enough information, I'll break it until I can. And, uh, I know size and microservices is a big, big debate, but I like to think that it's a microservice if you can rewrite it in two weeks. Otherwise, it's, it's bigger than a microservice. Cool, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. talk is collaboration, but given that it's only 10 minutes, I'm pretty much going to focus on pair coding uh, as a particular type of collaboration, but I think a lot of the lessons you can learn uh, or the things that I can say about pair coding actually apply more generally to good collaboration practices as a team. Um, I got, had my first software engineering job almost exactly 20 years ago, so it was October 95, I think. Um, and apparently, I discovered today, Agile was around in the 90s, but I certainly hadn't heard of it. You know, I had no idea of its existence, and I didn't find out for a few years. But if at that point you had said to me um, that uh, you would introduce the concept of sitting with another developer all day and working on the same computer at the same time, I would have been horrified. And certainly a few years later, when I and my colleagues did first hear about it, we were horrified. It was like, you must be kidding, you know, and that, that just sounds like hell. Um, and now, 
I do use pair coding on a daily basis. Um, uh, at Late Rooms, I'm using pair coding, and also the work, the team is more collaborative than anywhere else I've ever worked. So I have used pair coding at one other company uh, on a regular basis, but only one other company in 20 years, uh, and I love it. But um, I've only been at Late Rooms for a few weeks, and I've, I've been thinking about it a lot, and I've been thinking why I love it, you know, and what's, what's good about it. So, uh, you know, that's, that's basically what I want to talk about. But um, there are disadvantages, as well as advantages. Uh, and I used to be a high school maths teacher, and one of the things that you learn as a teacher is something called the sandwich technique, which is where you praise, and then you criticise, and then you praise again. So I, I'm going to do a few advantages, a few disadvantages, and then I'm going to come back to the advantages so that we end on a happy note. Um, but can I just ask people to just shout out, um, you know, give me what you think is an advantage of pair coding. Quality. Hands up, sorry? Quality. Quality, okay, yeah, so you get quality code as a result. Yeah. The code has a better quality, okay. Gemma? Getting to check Twitter. What's that? <laughs> there you go. Getting to check Twitter. <laughs> okay, you get to check Twitter, that's interesting. So you reckon that you get to do that more as a part of pair coding? <laughs> okay, well that, that was going to come up as one of the disadvantages, actually, so there you go. But more advantages? Learning from other people. Learning from other people. That's a brilliant one, yeah? Okay, well I, I'm, I'm going to go through my list. Some of, some of this has already been covered. So uh, I've got plugging gaps in each other's knowledge, which is, you know, the learning from each other. And I, um, one company that I did work for, which was when I started to become more aware of collaborative practices, I worked for a company, um, Mark worked for the same company, where we were very much encouraged to ask questions. And when I arrived there, that was a breath of fresh air because I had worked for companies, in fact, I had worked for a company in the past, where all of the really important knowledge was in the heads of two people. And, you know, we all needed to ask some questions all the time and they were never available because they were always firefighting and they were the only people who knew anything. Uh, and, you know, I didn't like asking questions because I didn't like mithering people or I didn't want to look stupid. And so to be in an environment where questions were not only encouraged but supposedly you could be sacked if you didn't ask enough of them, um, I mean, that was a breath of fresh air. And pair, in pair coding, um, being able to ask each, being able to actually say to somebody, I'm not sure what's the best way of doing this, and then learn from somebody, the person who's sitting right next to you, you know, a better way of doing it, or just, you know, finding out what's in their head, that's, that's just really useful, so that's, that's a great one. Getting help when you're stuck, another company that I worked for, actually the same one where there were the two people who were a bit clever, I sat on a piece of software for weeks that I was barely making any progress on. And I could, because there weren't daily updates, nobody was really asking me questions about what I was doing. In fact, I think that we thought that we were respecting each other by not mithering each other. Uh, and so I could just, you know, get stuck, not ask for help. The longer I left it, the more embarrassed I was, the harder it was to admit that actually I don't know what I'm doing. I'm completely stuck. If you've got somebody sitting next to you, you get stuck, you know, they know about it instantly. You can ask them. You're going to get help. And if both of you get stuck, I think it's a lot easier as a pair to say we're stuck than as an individual because there's a bit less of that thing, oh, God, I'm really stupid. But if you're both stuck, then, you know, it's easier to say to other members of the team, we're stuck. Um, another one is that when it does go wrong, you're much more likely to get back onto a good path. So, you know, when you, I have a horrible tendency to fall down rabbit holes and to get distracted by some irrelevant detail. And I know I'm doing it as well, but I just think, yeah, but it's really interesting. But I really do want to know what will happen if I keep, even though I know that actually it's probably irrelevant. If there's somebody sitting next to me, I can't get away with that, you know. And so you, you're much more likely to get pulled back on track when you start veering off. Because somebody's going to say, well, why? What, what are you doing? Why are you going in that direction? So that's another good one. Um, bad habits. You might have bad habits that you don't even know you've got. Or you might have bad habits that you know you've got, but you can't be asked doing anything about it. And when there's somebody, again, sitting next to you, they, they're more likely to notice, they're more likely to suggest other ways of doing things. You're more likely to be embarrassed by the bad habit and just not do it in the first place. Um, so there's that one. Uh, and code reviews happen automatically. You know, I mean, I, I've worked in, in fact, most of the companies I've ever worked for have had the concept of code review. Um, and I've never seen it work very well because it, when it's done purely by one individual who writes a piece of software 
another individual reviews it, because that other individual probably hasn't got time to understand it in depth, probably can't be asked to understand it in depth, you're not going to explain it to them properly, they may as well just sit next to you and do it with you, because they're going to understand it then, and they're going to be able to review it more effectively. So there's some advantages. Has anybody got any disadvantages? Stressful. Sorry, say that again? Stressful. stressful, yeah, yeah, it can be really stressful because you know you're kind of um, you're exposed, you feel vulnerable, you know, because like particularly if you think that the person sitting next to you knows more than you do, then you're just like, oh, I'm really embarrassed, I don't know what I'm doing, I think this is really stupid, I'm just gonna let them do it all, or I'm just gonna they're gonna see how crap I am, and oh, and and you know, it's just you constantly, it's like some you know, you're being you, you can feel like you're being judged and observed constantly and that that can be horrible but I think that's a really important one to address so one of the things that I found is really useful is to say to myself is to consciously focus on noticing when the other person makes the same mistakes that I would make and go ah right okay and also notice that the other person unless they're absolutely amazing is going to make mistakes isn't going to understand everything is going to ask stupid questions and you need to notice that. You need to think, oh, right, so other people do that too. I'm not as stupid as I thought I was. You know, so, yeah, and you, you have to, it's something you have to address. And also, not only do you have to address in yourself, you have to be aware of it in other people. So if you're coding with somebody and you think they might be feeling a bit insecure, big mug of it. Be nice to them. Encourage them. Let them have the keyboard. <coughs> let them make mistakes and don't judge them when they do. Um, so, yeah, any other disadvantages? Does it rob you of the chance to finish a train of thought? That's a really good one. Yeah, so you might want to just focus on something. And because there's somebody, like, there's, there's a few things in that. So, for instance, I've noticed that um, I can um, I can feel like what I really want to do at this point is just have a bit of quiet time because this is really complicated. And I'm feeling like, because there's somebody sitting next to me, that I have to understand it really quickly. And I haven't got time to just get my head around it. Um, so there's, there's that. And there's also, you know, just sometimes you, you can't focus, can't concentrate on somebody sitting next to you. At which point you say, shall we split up for a minute? Because I've done that now. I didn't do it at first because I felt kind of embarrassed and insecure. But I do that now. I say, look, this is actually really confusing me. And I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. So is it okay if we split up, go back to our own desks? And I just want to just kind of... Just, you know, folk tunnel in on it for an hour or so, and then we'll come back. And the two times that I have said that, two or three times, the other person has nearly always gone, oh, yes, please. You know, they felt the same way. And even if they don't, they'll, you know, it's absolutely fine. And I think that's, there's another disadvantage which can be burnout. out. It's intense. It's really intense. It can be exhausting. You do want to look on Twitter. You want to look on Facebook. You want to answer your text. You have slow days, you come into work, you're hungover, you don't feel like working with somebody else, you know. So you say, but I, uh, it's not a good day for me. I, I, I don't want to do parent today. You know, is it okay if, I, if we just split up and work on it separately or if I work on this other thing that I've got going on or, you know, it's, and that takes strength and it takes confidence, but it, it comes into something that I think is absolutely key, which is honesty. You know, be honest about how you feel, about how you understand, about what you think should be happening. If you're not in the mood, you know, just all of it. Be as honest as you possibly can because it, it just it really makes a difference. Um, how am I doing for time? Uh, I forgot to put my timer on. We're probably ahead of schedule because I've been about the hay so far. So. Okay, so I can be about the hay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I have a working time for Matt though, so... Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just checking. <laughs> okay. um, so, any more disadvantages? It's a waste of resources. <laughs> it's a waste of resources, of course it bloody is. There's two people. Yeah. It's a massive waste of resources. It's two people, probably on quite high salaries, um, doing one job. So, yeah, a bit, it can easily look like that. But then you think about the fact that you probably will move more quickly. You might not. You probably will. Uh, but even if you don't, you're sharing knowledge. <coughs> so, you know, you're, you're, because otherwise, whatever that piece of work is, uh, you know, no matter how much you try and make it self-commenting and try and share it, it's, the knowledge is going to be more in the head of the person that did it. 
Uh, and also, chances are, within a team, you're going to have a mixture of skills, you're going to have a mixture of strengths, there are going to be things that you're good at, things that your colleagues are good at, they're not going to be the same things. By working together, you're sharing those skills, which making you're making yourself much more efficient, you're sharing domain knowledge. The long-term benefit of that, I, I, it's very difficult to measure, but I think it's it's big. And then there's the, um, the code review element of it, the, the QA element of it, the fact that you're so much more likely to write a quality piece of code. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to quantify, but, I, you know, I mean, I, I think probably, I am, I know, I'm aware that I'm probably preaching to the converters, and probably, if not everybody, then most people in this room are probably already sold on it, but, but yeah, it's, it's, it's great to have an employer that gets that, that can see that actually it's not a lot of efficiency, or if it is, it's worth it. Um, I've got, another disadvantage I've got is complacency, because I think what can happen is, you can, uh, you can be very much, complacency is definitely a problem when you're working on your own. And you can assume that because you're working in a pair, therefore you can't possibly be being complacent. But actually what can happen, and I have seen it happen, is that because you're working in a pair, you assume that therefore it's bound to be quality and you're bound to be doing it the best way. Actually you're just both making the same mistakes <coughs> and you're both being lazy. And, and you're just assuming it will all be fine purely by the merit of being in a pair. And I, you know, that's, that's not necessarily true. Um, and cutting corners, this is kind of comes back to that thing I was saying of not necessarily thinking about something in depth because you're, you're worried about not working fast enough or pissing the other person off. So I, I found that sometimes you can cut corners because you don't want to look stupid or because you don't want to slow things down. So I quite often will think, actually, I'm not really sure I understood that bit, or I'm not actually convinced that was the best test, or, you know, that was the best piece of code, but I'm aware that we're in a bit of a rush, and so I won't say anything. Or, I'm, I'm a bit OCD, I, I like to make sure that everything is right, and I know that I do that more than some other people do, and I kind of, sometimes I go, oh, I don't want to say anything, because I'm just pissing off. But, but don't, you know. Trust your instincts. That's that's the kind of coder that I am. So it's at least worth me saying, look, I'm not convinced that we double check this thing over here. Can we just check that again? At which point the other person can have an argument with me and say, well, actually, no, it's fine because it's A, B, and C. But it means that I've voiced that concern. So, you know, that's another, it can be tempting not to do that. But that's another one that, that you have to watch out for. Um, so I'm going to finish with advantages. So, um, one adva another advantage is that you get the opportunity to properly discuss disagreements and alternative ways of working. So, you know, if you're if you're not convinced about the way like, better way of doing or you don't agree, because you're sitting next to each other, you can actually talk about it properly. You know, not in a meeting where everybody's like, oh, time to, you know, like but actually properly consider what you're doing. Um, and you, I, I've already said this one actually, but I do think it's important is to pay attention to what other people are doing and notice that they're not perfect either. You know, and I think pair coding could easily result in you feeling insecure and miserable, or it could result in you feeling confident and happy, and the attitude that you bring to it will determine which one of those it is. So if I'd say just two things, ask questions, be honest, keep doing it over and over again, keep asking questions, keep being as honest as you possibly can. That doesn't mean telling them when they've got BO, but <laughs> if you can, be honest. Okay. That means this might be practical. 
the advice for a few weeks. So let's uh, imagine this. <laughs> if you're dealing person notes from the side, <laughs> then uh, send they don't curl up and fall off. <laughs> uh, okay, so <laughs> let's say this is our ready poll. And this is our doing poll. And over here, shortly, will be our done poll. So let's assume that we're not always picking from the top. So if someone's picked this one, next up, they see this one and they think, actually this looks really difficult. They fancy doing that. I'll pick this one. Next person finishes that bit of work, sees this one, thinks, sure, that looks very dark too. Let's, uh, let's pick this one. And all the, all the time, things are just moving up here. So you don't have any visibility, but actually you've still got the same thing at the top. And uh, it's not, not moving through. So actually what you're doing here is you're hiding the fact that you have a second queue, a second ready column for people who want to do the hard thing. <laughs> and this has, this has a few big disadvantages. Firstly, and most obviously, this bit of work isn't getting done. And secondly, you're also introducing competition into your team because everyone's fighting to, to do this bit, not this bit. No one wants to be left with the point where... the point where there's only this bit left, so everyone's rushing to do the other stuff instead. So... How should this be working? So rather than just move our ready column over to here. <laughs> so what should happen is someone should finish a bit of work, pick the top one, and even if it's a bit harder, go ahead and do it anyway. Now the, the advantage of working this way is your your lowering cycle time. So the time from when something enters your ready column to when it enters your done column. The disadvantage is you may not be the best suited person to do that piece of work. So if something is particularly complicated, then if you're if you're a more junior developer, then you're more likely to struggle with that. So what can we do about that? Uh, I'd say I call this idea what I call truly cross-functional teams. And by that I don't mean that you should be getting your product owner and your BAs to all learn coding and all be expert developers, because that would be a terrible idea. <laughs> uh, what I mean is that everyone of a particular function, for example a developer, should be able to pick up any task. That sounds kind of like kind of almost a bit of a pipe dream, but I think that is achievable. If you if you have enough slack in your system so that you can uh, mentor your more junior developers and pair on them so that they can they can know what you know whilst or working together on a more complicated task, then they'll <coughs> then they'll get up to speed more quickly. And next time, they won't be fighting for those easier tasks. Does that make some sort of sense to them? Yeah. Okay. Well, that was everything I seem to have <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah. Any questions? No? Okay.
We have two more talks. If anybody else, if we have time at the end, um, which Matt and Gemma go in next week, we probably won't. If anyone likes to do a ad hoc talk, feel free to volunteer. We had a fantastic one last year, very inspirational. Um, please remember bit.ly slash xpman61 for speaker feedback and for the jet break raffle. Yeah. Feel free to do an ad hoc talk over mine if you want. So, show of hands, first of all. <laughs> <laughs> That's about as abstract as it gets. <laughs> so, who writes code? Yeah. Who works in a language that encourages abstractions? Gets oriented by uh, Who doesn't write code? But occasionally thinks, yeah, that's that's a good start. Okay, who doesn't like code on a regular basis? Okay, it's not me. It's a bit techy this one, so that's fine. But there are abstractions, I think, that um, aren't always apparent exactly what they are. And is that me? <laughs> that's abstract enough. So. There are abstractions that um, I think some of them we're very familiar with and some we're not so familiar with. So if I were to say shape, triangle, square, circle, animal, dog, yeah? All the typical very early stuff you might do in uh, your uh, object-oriented experiments very early on in your career probably. Uh, we're going to talk about abstractions that are typically technical. But when we're faced with a technical choice, they can become quite contentious. And we can quite a lot of debate around what the abstraction is. So, if you're writing code, you're delivering products, you're most likely dealing with this as an abstraction. A customer. So, what I'm going to talk about is a scenario that happened to us in a recent product development uh, sprint. And it was just interesting because we didn't expect the abstraction to cause so much uh, debate. So we're working with a customer. We want to introduce them to our product. We're not going to make any um, revenue, let's face it, if we're not introducing our customers to our product. So in this case, Let's call that product a policy, an insurance policy. So, first question is, how do we go about introducing our customers to these products? In our case, it's very simple. We've got a digital journey down here, which consists of an application that can run on browsers and handsets. And as soon as you start to introduce the idea of a digital journey, introducing your customers to policies, then you start to think about other things. So when is the customer a visitor to your digital journey? When do they progress or promote to being an applicant? Then is the point where they might want to actually apply for a policy. Then it gets a little bit more complicated because in our implementation, which at the moment seems pretty simple because we've got a nicely um, constructed domain, if you like. Digital journey down here. Problem here is that um, we've got a third party that we have to integrate with for various reasons. That third party is giving us the ability to identify our visitors, our applicants, our customers, so that we can, through regulatory um, guidance and regulatory uh, due diligence and all the rest of it, actually allow this person who's visiting and who's applying to hold the policy. The complication for us, of course, is that that third party has a very specific idea, a very specific abstraction that they want us to know about and to use if they <coughs> provide that service to us. So they've got an idea of a session. 
So if you imagine that session, you make a call out to, has an authentication token. So it starts to become a technical boundary context. Something is starting to make us think very heavily about what do sessions mean. Okay? So that's on the one side. Remember, remember it's a third party, completely external system. And there's no way we can get away from using that section. You have to have an authentication token if we're going to have any interaction with that third party. Forget the domain for a second. We're all the way back to what we're actually meant to be doing, which is delivering a digital journey, compelling website, nice journey, good UX, good UI, everything that we want. Um, and on the other side of the landscape, uh, we, we also have a session. This boundary context is all about HTTP. And there's a controller in there. In our case, it's um, don't build this. In our case, it's a spring controller. Yeah. <laughs> so whether we like it or not, if we want to deliver a digital journey that introduces customers to policies and be compliant with regulations, we have to use this third party. We've got a session over here with authentication tokens and all the rest of it. And a session over here which has the you know, web server lifecycle, an idea of uh, the identity of the visitor, the requests and responses and stuff like that. But really we're quite happy and comfortable with the fact that we've got a domain that's quite expressive. We don't want to lose that abstraction. <coughs> the abstraction's in here, it's a neutral boundary context. It's clean, it works, it's, it's been fully tested, all the rest of it. But we somehow have to resolve the information in a session from a third party with the information in a session on the controller. If we're going to allow that person to visit and successfully hold the policy. So the problem we have is that we really didn't want to introduce the word session into our domain. Because customers, policies, visitors, applicants, products, things like that. It just didn't seem the right place for it to go. So the temptation, of course, was to skip around here, yeah, and start to share that information and completely avoid all of the value that that, that neutral domain boundary context was giving us. Which is obviously not. That's not going to work. So somewhere there was an abstraction for the session. HTTP session, some obscure third party session. How are they ever going to meet in the That's something interesting happens when we start to talk to SMEs a bit more, QAs and BAs. And we try to raise the level of abstraction a bit. Because there had to be a way for the sessions to be There just had to be. And it's quite a surprising thing that happened. We forgot about all our technical band contacts, HTTP, REST, or whatever's over here. I think it's so actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see. Yeah. Fitting that thing together. So, um, we did a, a, I don't know if this is triangulation, but something happened that broke that deadlock. Some kind of triangulation happened where we were too embedded, you know, we need to solve this technical problem, how the hell do we get a session to, to work on? And we just thought about well, the high street. So this um, this vendor, this provider of policies has a high street outlet. And if you're a customer who's visiting that high street outlet and you happen to talk to an advisor there, the likelihood is that you're going to start a session with that advisor to talk about the plan for a policy. And that advisor is going to take you on a journey in a session, a one-to-one -one session, and ultimately you're going to end up with a policy and walk out your hand. Uh, so, this is when we start to think, well, session seems to it does belong here. It does belong here. Why should we have to fix your to go and like that? domain should have a session there. 
So it's pretty much what we did. Stuck the session in there. So to technicalize, it looks like it isn't wrong. But now the QA, BA, the SMEs in the business, perfectly happy that we've modeled the session that was neither bound to technical constraints, actually modeled on what actually happens out in the high street. <coughs> so it gets interesting then. Scenarios that fall out of that uh, abstraction are things like abandon. So when uh, the visitor to the website abandons that session, closes the browser, or decides they haven't got interest in the policy, we want to instrument that and capture it, and maybe send them an email to say, look, we've noticed you've dropped out on a digital journey. Is there anything we're doing wrong? Would you like to come back and restart the application or continue, continue the application? We've modeled it. We can call session abandon. Job done. Um, session abandon here, of course, would invalidate this session, invalidate that session, and in another boundary context down here, send out an email. What's surprising about that is <coughs> that when we put another context in, which we haven't really thought about at the time, which is support context, and um, start to think about who we can talk to about that, we saw that this is possible about this, you know, surprise, surprise. Um, but in support context, if we had a, another web app here, that was wholly owned by the business, but we're still concerned about what sort of journey is going on over here. The support context um, thought quite happily abandoned that session if it was a suspicious activity. So that's about it. Um, it was an interesting one for us because we saw that the two technical constraints were uh, needed to be resolved. And being developers who like to discover things on whiteboards, we really found ourselves a little bit narrow in our view of what a session was. When we opened it up, raised that level of abstraction up a bit, we found that we could put it in there, and it opened up all sorts of other discussions with other areas of the business, other contexts, um, most uh, interesting of all is high street context and support context. That's it. That's what happened. Any questions on my drawing skills? Or? <laughs> so you all got it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So anything that's is that clear or yeah. Well, boundary contexts are do can express the same thing. And that's where context maps come in. Yeah. So a session down here might have um, something to do with uh, spring uh, life cycle model or something like that. And the session up here was primarily concerned with uh, their authorization table. So completely different shapes to these things. But um, yeah, some common ground here. You know, in terms of methods, in terms of actual behaviour. But um, session, session, session is perfectly fine in the domain driven design sort of way because the boundary contexts are intended to be mapped using context maps. So, anti corruption layers. So, what we've got here is an anti corruption layer that says, okay, you, we understand we have to deal with authorization tokens. We get that you've got a session and we have to use it. But we're not necessarily going to use it the way that, you know, literally, we're going to map it to what a session means to us. Likewise, here. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Yeah, just talk amongst yourselves. Get a beer. Right, what's on my screen before I uh, pull a game? So you know how we've got, we've now got all this nice free time. I think we might end up taking it all up at the end of the way. Yeah. Um, half of my first gin and tonic got knocked over, so I'm nowhere near as pissed as I should be. Right. Book three codes. Yay! So, um, Kirsty built this as the book three backlog. But where I work at the moment, which she was with uh, the lovely Jimothy, who was doing the post alerts before, we work without a backlog. It's like pantomime this. Come on, a bit more. <laughs> There's no backlog. Um, so when I talk about this, the biggest question people always ask is, well, how are you going to chat the books? <laughs> It's a philoso raptor. <laughs> but that one's thank you. So that's the biggest question people always ask me. So that's my answer. We simply do not have books. We have book free code. Honestly. Did Microsoft say this as well? <laughs> <laughs> this is you lot right now. Oh really? No books? Tell me more. <laughs> Can you, yeah. Can you do the rest of this talk without any meat? No! <laughs> <laughs> I got very lazy before. Um, I was also planning to do a talk across the road for the Manchester Digital Council, so if I start lapsing into, I'm Gemma, I've been developed for 10 years, you should vote for me. That's why. So, yeah, this is usually the thing that people don't really believe me, that we have bug free code. Well, you'd be right. I don't write book free code. Nobody does. I definitely don't, as most people who work with probably know. Um, so, what am I actually talking about? This. We don't have books. So, when I talk about book free code, I mean we don't tolerate them. We just don't have them. Make sense? No. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's because. When a book comes along, we stop what we're doing and we fix it. There's so many memes. I went through all the characters and I was like, I'm one for each one. Uh, that's, that's usually James hitting me, by the way. Don't you all wish me James? Um, yeah, so as soon as a book comes along, we, we literally just drop whatever we're doing, we throw everything at it, and we get rid of it. Make sense now? No more memes. So how we've done it is quite simple. Firstly, we started off with Greenfield Development, so we had no books to begin with, which is something that I know you all envy and wish you had. We TDD. And because we're test driving, because we're writing all these tests all the time, it means that books that do come up, we can squash them and they're not going to come back. And we've got confidence in our software. Because we've got our confidence in our software, we can continuously deploy. So literally just change a line at a time and it goes out all the time. So we're doing things like we're doing microservices like I touched on before. Probably not well, probably not right, but you know, we try. And this no backlog really, really helps. Because we don't have a backlog, it means that the bug can't go to the bottom of that list and live there for a bit and get pushed down and pushed down and pushed down because there's more important things. Who thinks bugs are important? So why do we keep them in bug tracker? Why do we let them all hold up? Why do we give in to the new starts in the team, all the graduates that come in, all the second class citizens, to fix bugs? Why? We don't tolerate them. 
What are you looking at then? Who's a second class citizen to you, Coastals? He's a graduate child. <laughs> <laughs> automate the internet. So you know the internet's made up of lots of interconnected networks. That's what the internet is. That's what we do. We connect those together. And in our room we've got network engineers who know the domain, so touching on what uh, Mr. Cannon, Mr. Cannon. Hi Mr. Cannon. So we can speak about the abstractions. We've got someone there to talk to at the start. We, because we're working in this very um, quick, quick way, where it's literally just changing line of code, we've got the people there in the room that need to ask questions and keep, continually keep adjusting our understanding of the language and what we're working on. It means we can do that because we have them there. Again, something that not everybody has, and I appreciate this. So yeah, this is something that we do. So. Um, and when we started at the company, or well, when I started at the company, um, it was completely greenfield, brand new startup inside an existing company that already had the network and dark fibre. Everybody sat there and had all these ideas about how it should look, how it should work, all the features it should have, and they built this massive list of shit. And I started doing all the BA things of like writing them all down on post it notes and then writing them up in a wiki for people and spending all my days writing shit out that I really wasn't enjoying. And I finally thought, why the hell am I doing this? So unbeknownst to everybody else, I got these post-it notes and I threw them in the bin. I think I need more drama there, come on! <laughs> That's better. And I was able to do that because people really like it when you write their ideas down. This is something I learned a long time ago. If you write down their idea, it's out of their head and it's your problem now. And they'll shut up and they'll stop banging on about it. <laughs> if we'd have done every single little thing that had been in that massive big pile around that table, one, we wouldn't have released the product, especially not in 90 days. Two, it would have done so much shit that nobody wanted and nobody needed. There was all these talks about it should be like the London Underground. It wasn't. I'm <laughs> 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 a really good joke. Right? <coughs> so they didn't know that I'd thrown everything away. They still thought we had this big backlog of stuff that was going to be done. We eventually managed to sort of train people by going, okay, we've finished this feature, and they can see us working all the time. And because we're continuous playing, we're continuously getting out the door, we've got the people in the room. So again, we have the engineers, but we also have the CTO. And in the main room, so a short walk away, because you know, if you work with computers, you can stand off. <laughs> your mouth oh. and your eyes and your hands if you're slightly Italian. <laughs> and we even had the sales team, so we had everybody in there, everyone could see that we were delivering. And the way we got away with this no backlog is by every time we finish something we go, right, what's the most important thing for us to work on right now? And that ends up getting all building up this trust with everybody to the point where we did have like three things on the board. That's kind of our backlog, very loose. So we'll go up and go, that's been on for about a week or two now. Picking it up off the board, rolling it into a ball and throwing it in the bin. And that made me so happy. Is anybody else seen that? No. I've got skills. But yeah, write things down, get them out of people's heads, they really like that. But yeah, because you're continuously deploying, your code's always in a completely working state. And if you have managed to build anything up on your machine, it's no more than an hour or two's work that you can just throw away. And because 
you are working on stuff in such small chunks, the distraction of taking away and having to delve into something else because you've not understood feature right or someone's done something really, really retarded and completely wrong against the way you designed your system because you know, users. Yeah. Should we got more laughs? <laughs> I need someone here with sounds. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so yeah, because of that, we can start what we're doing. We can fix the bug, we can change things, and we can take stuff and go, okay, what's the most important thing to do now? Okay? <laughs> I've lit the building. Anyone got any questions? Yes! The resource, the, the resource, <laughs> the people,
actually ringing up a customer and saying, hey, you found this problem, uh, we've fixed it now, or ring up, hey, you found this problem, can I just talk through how it happened? Um, we've also got very, very technical customers because the people we're selling to are like, we're, we're like an ISP for ISPs, as James likes to explain it. So our customers are very, very technical. They've got data centers, they've got engineers. Um, they usually are using some weird browser like Opera and some weird operating system like Red Hat or something weird. Um, and they've probably got all their JavaScript turned off and ad blockers and all this shit, so nothing's going to work. Um, so it's good to ring them up and talk to them. And they really value that. We've got quite a small customer base as well, which is nice because it means you can actually do that and take the time to do it. And then when you fixed it, ring them up, delight them. Yay, more money and kudos and they are to the friends and shit like that. You have a question, sorry. Yes, guy, you knocked over my gin. It's <laughs> 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 just about the opportunity you got some So it's more really that you don't track the box. So it's not that you fix every single bug as soon as it happens, but rather the ones that aren't worth fixing, you don't bother tracking them and instead of the things that are Um, yeah. If you want to say that. <laughs> that sounds much more succinct than that. Oh, sorry, do you think there's anybody in the organisation who's got a secret list? And when you say what should we do next, they secretly consult their secret list. <laughs> no. <laughs> and I can guarantee that because we are, like, I'm sat opposite, literally opposite the CTO. And if he had a list, I'd be very shocked because he's got so much that he's having to do. So he's having to do tech vision, company, try to sell things, try to even go to data centres and like, you know, fix things as well. So we're all maxed out, we're all having to sort of chip in where and where we can. Even like sitting on um, service desk and taking phone calls on Christmas Eve and things like that. Go on, Jim, please. <laughs> why, why was that appropriate? <laughs> so, uh, and this question isn't a plan. How do you stop yourself reaching like almost a local optimum? I mean, how do how do it's a weird thing you how do we <laughs> how, how do we stop ourselves uh, like going off down the wrong path by always doing the most important thing but not getting into uh, an end goal which could be better than uh, some of the, uh, all of the important things. So, that, yeah, that's good, and I can see where you got that from. The segue from your talk. <laughs> um, so, one of the things we do, we don't do retros either. Uh, we don't do retros because it's just me and James. Uh, we've got the rest of the guys in the company as well, but we found that we didn't need to do retros because we were constantly having them. So, we're constantly sitting there going, are we working on the right thing right now? Is this making us money? Is this improving us? Are we delivering value? And you can end up going down this little rabbit hole. And another thing, we don't pair. Uh, we do pair organically, but if we paired all the time, because again, it is the two of us, I think James would have probably killed me. <laughs> anybody, anybody who's paired with me wanted to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> and if it was just me, day in, day out, for over a year... That, that was half a day. <laughs> Quite well made. But it means that we can just sort of stop and go, uh, should I be doing this? And we've not just got each other, we've also got the rest of the guys in the team. And we've got Neg, um, who... He's just a genius, isn't he? I think that's his job title. Nick can do anything. Nick can do coding, he can do monitoring, he can go do network engineering, he can, he can just do everything. And he does it really well. He's absolutely amazing. But he's he kind of gives us our steering of where we should be going all the time as well, and that really helps. Can I ask you a question? So, who wants to go and try bug free code? <laughs> who wants to go and try bug free code? <laughs> Charles. <laughs> if there's a mic, I dropped it.
Please do not. <laughs> Gym. Oh, I should have kept it on. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Jim's here. Hey! Does anybody know who Jim is? Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> guys. You've been great audience. Try the best. We're done. That's all of the scheduled speakers for tonight. Hey! However. As I said, last year we had a very inspired off the cuff talk in, in the dying minutes of the day. Would, would anybody like to uh, to stand up and say a few words that they hate? Anything to let me know. Failing that, we can all continue the discussions in the pub. Yay! <laughs> okay, uh, let's go to the English Lounge. It's on the High Street. It's. No. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 